right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first workshop of spring semester. Today, we are honored to have Elizabeth Wrigley Field speaking to us. She's a faculty member in sociology, and she's talking about length bias sampling as a unifying concept for demography. So, welcome, Elizabeth. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. It's still very cold. Here are three puzzles. Uh, American fertility fluctuated dramatically in the decades around the Second World War. We had the largest families during the Great Depression. Uh, sorry, we had the smallest families during the Great Depression, as you probably know. And the biggest families, of course, in the post-war baby boom. And yet, children born during the Great Depression came from larger families than those born during the baby boom. How can this be? In any given year in the United States, about half of the prisoners released will go back to prison uh, within five years. Yet, over their whole lifetime, prisoners who ever are released from prison, the proportion who will ever go back at any point is only a third, smaller than that half. How can that be? And people whose cancers are caught early by a random screening process often live longer than those whose cancers are detected later on when they go to the doctor because they've developed symptoms. Yet those same random screenings might not save any lives. How can that be? Here's the twist. These are all the same puzzle. The name of the puzzle is called length biased sampling. It's also called size bias. It's called that because it means seeing units in proportion to their size. So I'm gonna use those family sizes to explain how those worked. That example I started with, the fertility example, um, is an example of the most well-known application of length bias sampling in demography. Demographers know it because of this really famous paper by Sam Preston um, about family sizes from the perspective of children versus parents. And here's how it worked. So we go around and we ask every parent, how many kids do you have? And we're gonna simplify it and make it each set of parents, and of course some families have one parent and some have two and some have three or more. And we're, all, we're gonna smooth all that over and just imagine we ask one from each set of parent, how many kids do you have? And we get this very simple data set. We've got one family with one kid, we've got one family with three kids, we've got one family with eight kids. What's the average family size in this population? Four. Yes. How'd you do it? <laughs> Average. Yeah. So you add them all up, you divide by the number of families, which is three, we get our 12. Okay, but now we're going to do the same thing, but we just have a different sampling scheme. I'm going to go around and ask every kid, how many kids are in your family, including you? What data set do we get now? A, 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 A. Yeah, so we hear from this family one time, because that one kid tells us there's one kid in my family. These three kids each tell us there's three kids in my family, and these eight kids all say, well, there's eight kids in my family. And of course, if there was a family with no kids, they would not show up at all, right? Um, what average do we get? <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> There's always a quiz. How much? I guess 24 and two-thirds. You, got, you did something right and something wrong. 74 divided by 12. Yeah. Okay, why 74? All the bottom numbers added up. Uh-huh, and why divided by 12? That's how many numbers there are on the bottom. Yeah, so the average in this distribution, it's... The original number of kids in each family squared, right, because you hear from that three-person family three times, the eight-person family eight times, and now you're dividing not by the number of families, but by the number of children. In this case, you get a little more than six, uh, which is a lot bigger than four. Um, so in other words, we get a different distribution, and it's a bigger number. So that's length bias in a nutshell. Um, and this, by the way, is almost the only math I'm going to show. Not quite, but almost. I'm going to try to do everything in pictures. Why is it called wedge? 
It's called length because the original application had to do with carpet fibers. <laughs> but, so size bias is a better description, but it's just not used as often. Um, okay. So this problem has a lot of practical applications. Here's one from sociology. If you're interested in social mobility, you get a different picture of mobility if you start with a bunch of parents and ask what social origin do their kids end up with versus if you take a bunch of adult kids and ask what social origin did their parents have. You get a really different picture, of a potentially very different picture of how social mobility works. Um, and so that means you have to actually think hard about which distribution you care about, which one represents the process that you're trying to describe, and make sure you're not accidentally asking about one but answering about the other without realizing it. There's also some cool theoretical uh, implications here. So this is from Preston, and I really like this argument. It's cool. Um, so Preston points out that an implication of this is that if everybody had the same number of kids as were in their own family, that the population would radically balloon in size very fast. So like imagine those eight kids, each having eight kids, and you can see how you'd get this mushrooming population size. And real populations never grow as fast as that which means that people systematically have fewer kids than were in their own family. And so Preston puts this gloss on it that says, you know, if you think about family size as a reflection of traditional roles for women, people are systematically rebelling against their parents in every generation. So you might be thinking this is interesting, but it seems very specific. If you don't think it's interesting, you know, I have no hope for you. Um, this is cool, you know, but, but this does seem very specific, right? Like, I'm not a fertility researcher. Um, I do care about social mobility and changing ideas across generations, but like, you know, why else would you care about this? Yes? I, I mean, this is like Steve's dispute about households as a sort of software. Yeah, that's right. So, so Steve's thing is about um, uh, the number of kids who live with their parents has not declined, even though the number of parents who live with their kids has declined over time. I mean, my, my stats professor in college said this problem was everywhere. Um, he was right, or she, she was right. She was right. She was uh, right she. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So I want to argue that this problem is everywhere, specifically in demography. Um, and so I'm going to argue to you that length biased sampling is um, you uh, should be considered a fundamental a fundamental concept at the heart of demography because it's ubiquitous in substantively very far flung applications. Um, so most of us never actually learn about length biased sampling in our demography training. It's not mentioned by name in any of the major demography textbooks that I know. I checked all of them. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's not something that is formally usually taught in, in demographic methods classes that I'm aware of. But I want to convince you that that is a mistake um, because it's actually working everywhere. Sometimes those applications are really just length bias sampling. Often it's length bias sampling with something else overlaid on top. And so seeing the length bias part can help you break it down. Um, I'll show you examples of what that means. Um, and then finally I want to argue that recognizing the length biased relationship that's at the heart of all these different applications um, sometimes sheds new light on them. And the idea which I'll get to sort of briefly is that for any, is that there's multiple ways to represent a length biased relationship and for any given substantive application usually one of those ways is more intuitive than the others. And I think that learning to recognize them as all length bias gives you this heuristic where you can translate them into the less intuitive forms and sometimes get a new insight by seeing them that way in a way you would not have seen the problem. And then finally, I also want to convince the students in the room that part of what's happening here is that there's still actually a lot of low-hanging fruit in formal demography. Um, for example, there's a lot of places where demographers have developed one set of tools for looking at uh, a problem and other fields have developed different tools and by recognizing the problems as analogous you can actually get pretty far. Um, 
And in fact, you can often learn to do that and to make a real contribution, even if you don't necessarily have the strongest math background coming in, which was actually my situation starting um, this line of work when I first got interested in it in grad school. So that's kind of the underlying argument here, too, is like if you're interested in things like this, you should be able to work on them. And I would be very happy to talk with you about it. So for now, though, I want to turn um, to a particular application involving lifespans. And that's going to allow us to come back to those other two puzzles that I started with, the recidivism and the cancer screening. So the core idea here is going to be that lifespans are inherently length biased. Lifespans cluster time the way families cluster children. So let's see what that means. The application I'm going to focus on is something I call the average lifespan of the living. So imagine taking everyone who's alive at some moment in time, such as right now, and asking how will all of those people live in total. The average answer to that is this measure. So why might you want a measure like this? Maybe you want to study a rare disease and you don't have a lot of data on incident cases, meaning it's so rare that it's not practical to see people as they become sick, but you can take a sample of people who are already sick and then see what happens to them. Maybe you're interested in prison experiences and you want to ask of all the people who are in prison right now, how long will they be in prison on average? Maybe you're interested, both of those, by the way, are uh, places where there's a lot of work done um, that is uh, doing something a little bit different than the way um, that we're going to see it in, in, in a kind of demographic perspective. Uh, maybe you care about the relationship duration. What's the average marital duration for people who are married right now, et cetera? Um, any kind of question like that. There's a name for this kind of sample. Um, where you uh, take people experiencing a thing and then ask how long will they experience it. Anyone know the name? It's like retrospective? Uh, no. Uh, it often would be a retrospective measure, but there's a more specific name. It's not like synthetic cohort or something like that, where you would take current rates across. It's not a synthetic cohort, but it's close. It's a prevalent cohort. Mm -hmm. So we'll see why it's called that right now. So just to make things easy to start out, we're going to start by thinking about a stationary population. What is a stationary population? So basically, the rates of mortality and fertility are stabilized. So the age distribution population is changing at all? Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So the age distribution is not changing at all. We have this constant life table, which is just a fancy way of saying survival curve or age-specific death rates, who, how many people die at each age is constant. And the other thing is that there's no population growth, positive or negative. Every cohort is the same size as every other cohort. Um, every moment in time looks the same as every other moment in time. So we're going to start there just because it's a very simple setting. And the upshot is going to be, the big idea here is that in a stationary population, that average lifespan of the living is a length biased life expectancy. So let me show you what I mean and then we'll think about why is this useful. So who has seen a Lexus diagram before? Some people, okay. So. Our x-axis here is time, our y-axis is age. Um, so if I want to see a birth cohort, what shape is that? <coughs> yeah, it's going to be a diagonal line. And if these had the same scale, which they don't, it would be a 45 degree line. Um, so because the cohort starts at age zero, and then for every year that you advance in time, they age one year, right? So that's why it's that diagonal shape. Um, cohorts start from an unselected sample of people. It's everyone born at this moment, no matter anything else about them, and then they follow them over time. So the units are people. What if I want to look at a period? What shape is that? Yeah, 
just a vertical line. So period measures just take everyone who's around at some moment in time. The unit is time, not people. Uh, and that does select people on their longevity. So the longer you live, the more moments of time you're around, the greater a chance that someone like you is going to turn up at the single moment where we do, where we happen to be looking. Okay, so what shape is the prevalent cohort? Work with someone near you and try to sketch what you think it would look like. So this is like we take everyone who has diabetes right now and we ask how long will they live with diabetes? Why would just be that? Why would it would just be that? Why would it 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 just
that still have their deaths to come. So that's where the length bias comes from. The older the age you're talking about, that's how many cohorts will have deaths still to come at that age. So it's an exact analogy to the bigger the family you're asking about, that's how many kids will report they come from a family that size. Does that make sense? <coughs> Like yeah. an example. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you say that one more time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to know, I want to take everyone who's in the population right now in 2020, and I want to ask what is their total lifespan going to be on average? And so some people are going to die as infants. But for when I take the population in 2020, for you to die as an infant, you better be an infant right now. Because I can't die as an infant. I'm already too old for that. Uh-oh. That's not good at all. OK. And so the people who can die as an infant are just this tiny little tip of the data here that are babies now. But who can die as a 50-year-old? Well, that's the people who are 50 now, and 49 now, and 48 now, and 47 now, all the way back to babies. That's 50 cohorts worth of people. And it's the same, so the, the distribution of age of death that you get from this shape over-represents the older ages in the same kind of proportional way that asking kids how many kids are in your family over-represents the big families in that same proportional way, where you hear from an eight-kid family eight times and a three-kid family three times. An analogy that works for me, <coughs> just to make sure I understand, is if you want to find out how long people are going to be in prison, and you start with current prisoners, everybody who's only in for a month has a much lower probability of being in your sample than people who are in for life. Yeah, so that's right. So you're going to get an upwardly biased if you then conclude the average prisoner stays in prison for X years, that's not right. That's that's right. Or at least your question was ambiguous. Did yeah. you mean the average prisoner who's in prison right now, or right. did you mean the average person who ever goes to prison? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wouldn't you just wait differentially? Like the family of eight would be downweighted? Yeah. So if you have a prevalent cohort and you want to recover something like life expectancy, you want to recover the original cohort, you can just weight everyone by the their reciprocal. Right? So the eight-person family, each kid would count one-eighth of the time. Um, and that, in fact, is what... So there's a lot of math for prevalent cohorts in epi contexts, in prison contexts. They mostly don't talk to each other, so it's different math, but it's all trying to do the same thing. And, it, and that's always the kind of question it's trying to answer. It's like, how do you start from this shape and go back to a life expectancy? I think sometimes we might also be interested in this shape for its own, like sort of in and of itself. If what you care about is the experience of people who are actually experiencing something, like there's times where you might actually care about the experience of prisoners who's in prison at a mo in a given moment and not just the experience of everyone who will ever go to prison. Right? You might you might think that actually like when you think about what do prison conditions, what should they be like, what implications does that have, that you do want to think more about the people who are there longer. Yeah. I am happy. Is this the same or similar to what we would say survivorship bias? This is a form of survivorship bias. Um, so one thing, I'll come back to this if there's time in a more serious way, but just in a quick way. One thing that's important here is usually with survivorship bias, we're interested in it because we think that the people who were not as long lived and are not in our sample are systematically different in some way than the people who are in the sample. When what you care about is lifespans per se, then even if there's no differences and mortality is totally random for everyone, you're still going to have this kind of survivorship bias uh, because you're selecting on the lifespans directly. And so I, I work on survivorship bias. Um, and that, to me, is part of what makes this um, an interesting context. 
is kind of unlike all the other times that demographers talk about survivorship bias, where what we really care about is this assumption that people are systematically different from each other. All right. I'm going to move on. Um, there's some nice applications of this that involve shifting perspectives from lifespans uh, to mortality rates, which is mortality is the reciprocal of lifespan. Um, so you can think about lifespan as a waiting time to death. How long do I live before I die? And that's the inverse of how fast am I dying? Um, which is a weird kind of thing to say about an individual, but not a population, right? How fast is this population dying? Um, so when you view this from the perspective of mortality rates instead of lifespans, the picture you get is our prevalent cohort is starting from a whole bunch of cohorts with survivorships that look like this. And then it is truncating them like this. And so the only mortality that counts is the mortality after we take this cohort. And so we get this distribution where it's like all that mortality was zero. And then we have the survivorships only afterward. So that's the that's how this works in a nutshell. Um, and then I'm particularly interested in generalizing this to uh, not just stationary populations, but for example, to stable populations. So what's a stable population? That's one that's not necessarily. I mean, that's not experiencing growth, right? Um. It is experiencing growth. So like the stationary population, oops, that should say stable, but it says stationary. Like the stationary population, we still have this constant survivorship curve, but now we also have some real constant <coughs> growth rate. So the cohorts are getting bigger than over time, or they're getting smaller over time. So what is that going to do to our lifespans? So if we start with this picture, the intuition that we have is the same. We want the age at death for everyone who's currently alive. The higher ages have more currently alive cohorts who are going to contribute to deaths at those ages than the younger ages. But now all the cohorts are different sizes from each other. So what will this look like? I like to visualize it like this. So this is a heat map. Um, showing cohorts of different initial sizes in a growing population. So the warmer colors are bigger. And so um, each cohort is bigger than the preceding cohorts. Uh, and so that means that as you move up in age, those ages of death have more cohorts contributing to them, but those additional cohorts are smaller than the younger cohorts that also contribute to younger ages at death. And so you've got more cohorts, but they're sort of ever smaller. You have this length bias process, but it's attenuated. And so in a growing population, the period death distribution, which is this yellow line, is younger than the cohorts, which are this blue line. And the length biased average lifespan of the living or prevalent cohort line is still going to be higher than them, them both, but it's going to look more like the cohorts. You get the reverse in a shrinking population. So as you get older and older now, you have more cohorts potentially contributing to each age at death, but also those cohorts are bigger than the younger ones. And so this kind of wildly exaggerates the length bias. And so the period age at death is larger than the cohorts, and the length bias is larger still. And I'm going to do this part fast to get ahead to the other applications, but um, this gives rise to a formula for the average lifespan of the living, that prevalent cohort lifespan measure, um, that uh, relates cohorts and periods in a way that surprised me and that I think is really potentially useful, which is this. Um, the average lifespan of the living turns out to be just the difference between the cohort life expectancy weighted by the population's birth rate and the period average age at death weighted by the population's death rate 
all relative to the growth rate. Um, and this is the formula that is really, that is m the most new um, of the things that I'm showing you. And the reason why I think it is useful is that it's a starting point for thinking in a more serious way about how prevalent cohorts relate to periods and cohorts and being able to relate these three different lifespan measures to one another in a systematic way um, that is not in the epi or the prison stays or the marital duration literatures, um, but that I think demography in particular has a lot to offer. And so just for an illustration of what this would look like, I chose an arbitrary cohort life table and I varied its growth rate. And so the red line here is life expectancy. Um, that's the cohort's average age at death. It doesn't change with the growth rate because the growth rate is about how big the cohorts are, not about when they die. The green line here is the periods and the yellow line is the average lifespan of the living. It's always larger than both the periods or the cohorts, but it gets kind of tilted toward one or the other as the population grows or shrinks. Okay, and one last point about this. So thinking about those heat maps, right, where the cohorts are different sizes, you can also think about the growth rate as changing when in the, in the person's lifetime are you seeing them when you take this prevalent cohort, right? So we have all these different cohorts. We're taking each one at a different moment in time, in the population as a whole, how far into their life are we seeing them? Oops. Um, so in a stationary population where every moment in time is equivalent to every other moment, on average, we see people halfway through their lives. So the, age, the life they've lived so far, which we also call <coughs> their age, is the same as the life they have remaining. As the population is growing, we see them younger and younger, and the life they have remaining is greater and greater, and the reverse when it's shrinking. And the all is the sum of those two things. And so I also, you know, so we can also see, think of this as we're selecting people on how long into their total duration do they show up, as well as what their total duration is. Any questions about this part? In a stationary population, uh, length bias, this would not be an issue, right? Yeah, in a stationary population, you're along this line. Yeah, okay. And so the that part that is an issue is, so it's, it's a pure length bias situation, and so your cohort and your period average age at death are both here, but the average age at death of all the people alive at some moment is higher than that. Because we're, by taking people alive at some moment, we're still selecting people on their lifespans. But we don't have that additional issue that the cohorts are different sizes from each other. So, why go through this detail about lifespans? And this is only a little bit of detail. So I want to tell you where I'm going with this. Um, so prevalent cohorts are everywhere. A lot of the time they happen in contexts where other things are changing too, like incarceration rates are growing, marital rates are changing, disease rates are changing. Um, and so there's changing growth rates laid on top of a length bias situation, like we've been looking at with stable populations. Um, these length bias relationships can be seen from a lot of different perspectives, and triangulating between them is a good way to develop new insights. So for example, um, the formula that I showed you that relates periods and cohorts and prevalent cohorts um, the article that I'm writing about that has six different proofs of that relationship that all take a very different starting point. Um, and the idea is that by putting them together, you get a different understanding of how those are actually all the same thing. 
Um, so I want to give just the tiniest taste of that. Um, and so the here's how I'm going to do that. There are three main ways to express the average of a length biased relationship in terms of the original distribution. So what's the average family size that kids report in terms of the parents average? Or what's the average lifespan of the living in terms of cohort life expectancy? Or the average prison duration for people in prison now in terms of people who ever enter prison? So. There's three different main ways to relate those to each other um, that can all be derived from each other. And I am not going to really show the math details, but I want to present them. And so the idea is that this slide will be helpful to the extent that you know what any of these things are already. And if you don't, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, so one is what we saw in the family sizes problem that the length bias distribution is, is a kind of squared distribution of the original. The second is that the length bias distribution is the product, uh, oh sorry, is the sum of the original distribution and the squared coefficient of variation, um, which is, has to do with the variance. And the main idea I want you to get from this expression is actually two things, one is that no matter what, the length bias mean is always larger than the original mean. So the kids are always going to report bigger families than the parents are. That's how you get that population ballooning problem if we all recreated our parents' families. Um, the distribution you get of people in prison is always going to be bigger than the, than the people entering prison for the first time. But second, the extent to which that's true is going to depend on how variable the distribution is. So if families are really different from each other in size, then the children's distribution will look very, very different from the parents' distribution. If families are similar in size, they're not going to be that different. And the third is that the harmonic mean of a length bias distribution is the same as the arithmetic mean of the unbiased distribution. If you don't know what a harmonic mean is, don't feel bad about it because I didn't either until May until I started working on this. But if you do know what a harmonic mean is, then the insight that you should get from this is that length bias sampling is going to be extremely relevant to any context where we want to translate between something and its reciprocal. For example, where we might want to translate between a rate and an exposure, or a rate and a duration. And when I say it like that, you might be thinking to yourself, boy, that sounds like all of demography. We always want to think about rates and durations. And to that, I would say, yes. <laughs> um, so, oh good, we are OK on time. So I would like you, with people sitting around you, to pick one of the two remaining puzzles that we had, the cancer or screening or the recidivism puzzle, and try to figure out what's going on. Should I put the, I'll put the puzzles back up. I should have put it back here.
So it's like we like retrospective, like we ask them what they first got and screen. No, we're randomly giving people a cancer screening, like just okay. people in the population, and then some portion of people will turn out to have cancer, and so then uh, we observe those people compared to a control population that was never offered a cancer screening, but some people get cancer. So what when Two things. Uh, the other sort of helpful to think about it. Um, and the family is one I think it's a fan. Um, anyway, it's too late. Yeah, I'd love to see later what you I would love to I mean, there's a, um, there's a thing in the um, Oh, I would love to have those. Okay, yeah. take everyone back now, but I would love to yeah. All right. I'm going to show... You can keep thinking about this while I show you just a few more examples, and then we'll get to these two. Because it was early. So I told you that this length bias is ubiquitous, but I didn't show you that many examples. Yeah, I guess I was... All right. Have you ever been on Facebook and gotten depressed because all of your friends seem more popular than you are? <laughs> it's true. They are. <laughs> but it's not you. It's true of them, too. All of their friends are more popular than they are. So I'm speaking a little loosely, um, but the, the actual point is that the distribution of friends has more friends than the distribution of people. Um, so if you're friends with someone, by definition, they're someone who has friends. They're probably someone who has a lot of friends. That's, that's what makes them more likely to be your friend. So we're systematically more likely to be friends with more popular people sort of by definition, that's a length bias problem. Now, in fact, how you personally experience this has to do uh, not just with the length bias, but with the structure of the network in some interesting ways. Uh, but so one kind of clear application of length bias is to this kind of social networks. Um, sometimes that gives useful practical applications. If you want to figure out where is the flu going to have an outbreak, um, don't ask random people if they get the flu. Use a network study to figure out who's really popular and watch those people to see when they get the flu because they're the people who interact with a lot of others um, and they're going to be the super spreaders, um, especially if they also don't wash their hands. Um, but that's how you can predict the flu um, more quickly and easily than by sampling people. Um, this is one of the most famous sociology books of the last couple of decades. It's a really good book about um, its audit studies of uh, are, how do you get a job when you have a criminal record. Um, but in one part of the book, which is a small part, the author, Diva Pager, um, is trying to show that people's fears of hiring felons, if they're employers, their fears of hiring felons are misplaced. Um, so she conducts a survey and finds that 92% of people who currently employ a felon think that the felons are good workers. What's the problem with that? The good workers are the ones who work. Well, the bad workers got fired. The bad workers got fired. 
the employers who are currently employing a felon are the people who thought the felons were good workers. Right. It's not asking out of everyone who ever employed someone with a criminal record, how do they feel about the experience, right? It, it, it's a selected sample. Um, it's also, of course, selecting on the felon status being salient to the employer, right, which is probably its own kind of selection problem. Um, but one part of this is just a kind of incidence prevalence problem in disguise, right? Okay, so how about that recidivism example? Did anyone pick that one? Yeah, but did I figure it out? So the idea um, of this one is, um, so as a reminder, the puzzle is in any given year, about half of the prisoners released that year will return within five years. But out of all the prisoners ever released, only about a third will ever go back. And the trick is that prisoners are different from each other. Some will cycle in and out of prison repeatedly many times, and others will never return. And when you look at the people who are released in some moment of time, like over the course of a year, you are over-selecting the people who cycle in and out a lot. You see them in proportion to how likely they are to be exiting. And because that is related to how likely they are then to re-enter, um, you are selecting the cyclers. Does that make sense? Okay. And that brings us to one big application of length bias sampling in demography, um, even though we never express it this way, is frailty models of mortality or frailty models of conception, um, models that are based on attributing to people some stable risk that is different from other people like a stable risk of dying or a stable risk of conceiving, these heterogeneity models that we use all the time are actually models um, of length biased processes, right, where people die, the model imagines that people die or conceive in proportion to their frailty. And that brings us finally to our cancer screening. So I gather everyone else picked this example, right? Anyone feel like they figured it out? Like, like, let's say if cancer screening is not effective, which is what you said, at increasing your life expectancy. So, like, if say hypothetically, like everyone who got the cancer died on average three years out, then screening them earlier, like you would have caught them at like the, the beginning of their three years they had left. Whereas, like some people mm -hmm. will have already like been at the end, and then they don't have as much longer to live because they got screened later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing just to be super clear on, so I'm not saying that cancer screening doesn't matter. I am saying that even if screening doesn't matter, you could do a study where it looks like it does. So, um, so just to be super clear about that. But this is really the right kind of idea. Um, and there's really two different issues here. Both of them turn on the fact that screenings identify cancers at an intermediate stage where the cancer is advanced enough that it's detectable when we screen you, but it's not so advanced that you're already symptomatic to the point where you would have gone into the doctor and gotten diagnosed even if you hadn't been screened. So if we're imagining that everyone sort of travels along this progression where you start out healthy and then you have a cancer that's detectable by screening but it's not really bothering you to the point where you go to the doctor and then you're symptomatic and then eventually you die, the screenings pick people up in this stage. And there's two reasons why that matters. The first is called the lead time problem. This is not a length bias problem, it's just an additional problem, uh, which is that screenings catch people here, doctors of visits catch people here, so of course if we start measuring from here, it's a longer time until death, right? And that problem is relatively easy to deal with. Right, we can find out, we can estimate when you would have been diagnosed or uh, we can do other things. Um, we can look at age at death instead of duration to diagnosis, et cetera. But there's still a length biasing problem um, which at its core is a frailty problem and it's not actually about frailty of people but about frailty of tumors. <laughs> 
And the idea is this, tumors are differentially aggressive, so some develop faster than others. So when we do the screening, we pick up tumors, because the screenings catch cancers at this stage, we pick up tumors in proportion to how long do they spend at this stage. And if there's some correlation between how long they spend at this stage and how long they spend at this stage before you die, then the screeners are differentially picking up the slow moving cancers that are more survivable. And that's how you can get screenings looking like they're saving lives. The people whose cancers are detected through screening actually do live longer, but the screenings might not actually, uh, the treatment that they get after being screened might not actually make any difference. Okay, any questions about these examples? I don't know about cancer screening, but if your cancer was more aggressive and you were in the symptomatic stage when you got screened, wouldn't the screening still pick it up? It's yes, but the stage. idea is you probably wouldn't be eligible for the screening mm -hmm. because if you were already symptomatic, mm -hmm. the, you would have been more likely to already have gone to your doctor and gotten a cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so then the screening would be on the non-cancer population mm -hmm. or the not already diagnosed population. Okay, so I will take general questions, but I also have a question for you, which is because these have so many substantively far-flung applications, is there one that you are thinking about where in a kind of, maybe in a kind of subtle way, the question that you think you're asking might end up being different from the one that you can actually answer. Um, you might be inadvertently selecting on for example, how long people spend in a state. Is that a hand or? I have a hand on the game. I've been thinking about this a lot with like we're doing for my sociology and neighborhood class to interview people. Um, and so I feel like this is that thing about it. Normally it's sort of out there, it's like we gotta pick up a few of people who've lived in the place a long time. Um, but also as a more general process for sort of neighborhoods and like the fringe of application. Um, yeah, I feel like we were, that's a piece of thinking about the social and neighborhoods and workplaces. I like that neighborhood application, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have like a full answer for this yet, but I'm thinking about a study that I'm working with a team to start in Senegal where we're going to basically collect Chinese data on women who are either like pregnant or recently had a baby um, in order to try to figure out the impact of having a baby on their agricultural productivity. Um, so I imagine like if we if recruited someone into the study who was like early in their pregnancy that we might have a different sample now that I've heard this than talking to someone who is like later in their pregnancy or like shortly after their birth. Um, but I don't know if this necessarily applies since this study duration is still gonna be like a set amount of time. Like we'll be in the, you know, there for one year. So pregnancy we'll durations days. of pregnancies that go to full, you know, that go to birth um, are roughly similar in length to each other. Right? Right. Um, so in that sense, you don't have a, I don't think there's a detecting, early detecting late problem except to the extent that you care about pregnancies that are ended not with a birth. But I think you would have a length bias problem in the sense that you would be systematically picking up women who have more children. Okay. When, right, when you look at recent mothers. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're looking at the impact on their productivity, which I imagine would be mostly after the birth. Um, like when you have a young child, that that would be what would most likely impact your productivity. So maybe you would have people in like various stages of postpartum working. So to me, the most obvious application of this to that would be 
if the population that you care about is everyone who will ever have at least one birth, uh -huh. but, but then you're sampling people who've had a birth recently, you're going to sample people in proportion to the number of births that they have. It's very much like the recidivism case. Okay, so you're sampling like a more higher parity women. Yeah. Which might be like older women too. Yeah. Uh, actually, I wouldn't say that because so the moment in time where you're sampling, um, you'll have women of different ages whose total fertility over their lives will be longer, and it's those women who are just more likely to have more births who you'd be more likely to sample regardless of their age. Oh, I see. So even if we caught someone with their first birth, they're more likely to ultimately be someone who will have any births. Yeah. Like, so that's why they had a birth now. That's the idea behind the recidivism. Right, so it only comes into play to the extent that there's really these systematic differences between people in how likely they are to leave and enter prison or to have a bunch of kids. Right, so if births were random, this would not be an issue. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Seeing none, since we have like two minutes left, I will have you turn to someone near you and say, what is the main idea that you hope to take from this? Or what is something that you realize now that you would like to know more about that you don't know about yet? these conversations they are welcome to continue but it is 115 so I thought we could thank Elizabeth and if you want to continue talking please feel free